thank you. All right, and first of all, welcome everybody for attending my presentation. So today we're going to talk about security design anti-patterns. Those are patterns that came out of th threat modeling exercises, like the snippet that you see here in the screen, and a little bit about how to make this better in order to limit security debt in the future later on. All right, let's go over the agenda for today. First of all, I'm going to give you some background of why this topic. Then um, I'm going to talk about complex differences of controls, what that means. Then how an application will grow into security debt. And then we're going to dive into the security design anti-patterns. I have 12 of them planned for you. We'll talk about a common role misconception, then authorization anti-patterns, five of them, some timing anti-patterns, different variations of them, systems that don't mix well, scalability anti-patterns, and that at the end, we'll talk about what we can do about it, action items to limit security debt. Then, of course, later on, we'll open up for Q&A, suggestions, and comments. All right, a little bit of background. Why this topic? I started uh, leading the threat monitoring program here at my current employer, Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company, and I was part of the application security team. And in that in that role, we did some prototyping for threat models, <clears throat> and the the threat models were done in after the fact fashion. That means the application was already rolled out into production. There were some painful lessons that came out of this of th certain things that we are missed to implement. Uh, Shortly thereafter, I was moved into the um, assessments team, architecture and assessments team, which is um, not the pen testing assessment. That's like a security review that's, that does assessments, assessments very late in the game um, as a review and not um, early on. And the, the, the question always came up, when should we do a threat model? And I told them, well, we should do this, like you see here on the screen, very early on in the design phase of, of the um, software development life cycle. So I started taking notes and gave them an example of what happens when um, certain um, threats are not mitigated and dealt with. Those anti patterns, uh, those lists of anti patterns helped to onboard more teams. And then also I was able to describe worst case scenarios, what happens when um, certain things happen in a combination, when certain controls are missed. And then the purpose of the threat models versus the assessment, it, it, the threat model should explain or detect what should be there, but is not there, versus the assessments basically focus on what is there and if it is implemented correctly. So with that, I was able to uh, describe complex threat scenarios that were found and shared them with the teams. The question also came up, um, what can you do with automation versus manual modeling? I was doing manual modeling um, initially um, by doing, um, uh, by the prototyping. So the, the automation currently is only limited to finding what I call single hop threats. That's something that's related to a single to a single um, element that and that uh, and, and the more complex threats cannot currently be found because you would need some kind of a, a graph search or um, artificial intelligence system that go through a, a complex setup. All right, let's talk about complexity of security controls. Not all controls are, in, are are created equal. Security controls are used to to represent a function in, in the program, either as code or as an implementation, that that provides a guarantee. So, in the simplest form, they check something like a logical security feature, for instance, authentication. Then there's some they are more complex that implement something more behavioral, like behavioral security feature, for instance, encryption or decryptions. So there's a scale to this. However, overall. When you go and have to retrofit that later on in, in the life cycle, when you don't have them in place, there's, a, there's also um, the different, there are differences when um, what, what that means, if you can, easy, uh, if you can e retrofit them easily or not easily. For instance, turning off a public face in cloud storage, that's an easy switch, that's easy to do. Using a library feature like volume encryption, that's relatively easy too. just use a key and then encrypt the whole thing. Configuration change in like data in transit from HTTP to HTTPS, that's also relatively easy to do. Now, more difficult things to, to implement is um, adding security to already deployed code. So we always run the risk of breaking the code when you do certain things like this. Then, of course, if that you get more and more of this, you implement logical security at scale, even though the little um, components are all distributed all over the place. 
that's also hard to do. And then, of course, adding cryptographic protection to certain things is harder to do because you're usually touching more than one system at a time. Overall, there's, a, there's another dimension of this, though, so that the controls complexity that starts going up the more distribute, distributed deployed code you have already in place. So keep that in mind. Even the easy um, security controls will create a major headache if you have a lot of uh, of those, um, if, you, if you need to do this across a lot of, uh, across a big code base. All right, let's talk about how an application grows into security debt. So what is actually growing over time on an application? When an application grows, you're usually adding business use cases and functionality. Then, of course, code is added and the data is added to it. And with that, we're adding infrastructure instances. That all this comes from business requirements that run businesses um, as part of a role um, and that our systems run then. With that, we, we have users that we're adding users to the system. We have business application users, and then we have a, some different set of admin users that we're also adding to the mix. When we talk about security debt, so if you compare this to the financial world, what is actually debt? That means we're owing somebody money. In our sense, though, we're adding, we're owing the, the application a security feature. We're owing a workload item that we would need to implement for order in order to make the application secure. If you don't have that, it will show up in certain areas. For instance, we're missing security features would show up in audits or we have postponed security upgrades workload item that cannot be resolved in time anymore because it just breaks too many things at once. Now, of course, this leads to the bigger question. What actually is the equivalent of, um, of the bankruptcy case here for, for our security debt? In, in the bankruptcy case, in our case, would be the management notices that um, the application cannot be fixed in time anymore. And then they will go and make the decision at some point to, to create that shadow stack tech stack for instance with the promise of a new stack doing everything much better and for the developer unfortunately it's they might or might not be part of the new solution that's the un, the sad truth here that most of the time um the the people are changed out with with the project too all right let's jump into anti-patterns first one we're going to talk about is a conceptual anti-pattern in order to, to capture this, um, let's start with a question here. From an attacker point of view, which role is the most valuable from an attacker point of view? If you ask this question to a developer, they say, well, that's easy. Become root is the name of the game. The, the regular user be becomes sysadmin. That's the name of the game. Now, in our case, though, from the secure perspective, that's not where the value for the attacker necessarily is. The, Sales admin, though they has computing power in terms of like controls a lot of computing power, so that's a good resource and it can also control a lot of data. So if you, somebody captures that role, that's pretty good, um, and that could also lead to money. But if you think, ask yourself, who can make it actually rain in the company? The system admin, of course, can use computing power. Maybe um, if the, the attacker that gets into his role by um, holding my Bitcoin mining or data, for instance, for holding data hostage. But if you think about what happens when you call into a company and want a refund, there's usually a business role. I call it the business ferry here or a power user that has higher level um, access to direct access to money and then also to broad data. For instance, if you call in and want a name change, they could um, reach the, um, they can do that across a lot of different records. So the first and a pattern that I want to point out here is the failure to plan for a business role that's higher than sysadmin. The sysadmin should only be scoped and be a, to a lower role, like to a to a system, and should be actually conceptually be a slightly lower role than the business role, business user role. This pattern will carry forward in a lot of other anti patterns that I'm I'm going to describe that are in technical nature later on. So we'll um, recognize that and come back later to this. All right, we'll talk in the first set here, we'll talk about authorization anti-patterns. Um, in order to do this, I'm going to walk you through a sample web application, let it grow over time, and then show you how this potentially, where the anti-patterns are and, and how that could um, create security debt. So the first 
um, application we talk about is a stateful web application. Most developers here are probably familiar with this. We have a human user here, then we have our browser, and we have a web application, and then some kind of authentication authorization server that the human user would go and, and key in the URL into the browser um, and then bring up the login page. Then the data will be sent over from the login page to the web application. Then there's some kind of ping pong between the web application server and the authentication server. It could also go from the browser directly, but in our case, it doesn't really matter because at the end of it, we're going to have a session in memory. So that session is a piece of code that lives in memory that has an address, and then there's a username and a role in there. That session ID, the key to that memory space, is sent back to the application in the form of a cookie, and that's stored in the browser. So that's the regular stateful setup that most people are here pretty familiar with. On the operational side, we'll take a look at this, and we'll jump, um, how this works, and we're going to switch to a stateless in a minute here. But we have to first understand how this works. The user starts, for instance, with a cookie in order to bring up the count page that's protected. Logs in. Oh, well, doesn't log. So the cookie is sent sent over to the application, and that application does something what I call the go no go check. The basic checks in memory: Do we have that that session in memory here on under that address here? If that session is in memory, um, then the application goes and fetches data from the database and sends the data back and displays the data on the browser. So this is the stateful setup. Now. Most applications don't work like this anymore. They are more complex now. Um, they're using a um, stateless REST client. I'm going to explain how this works on the next slide here. So let's take a look at this. On the left-hand side, we're replacing the browser now with the user interface um, for static pages. And then there's a REST client in it that communicates with the backend. On the backend, we have our web to here that's also divided. We have a web application that serves the static pages. And then there's a gateway in it that or proxy component that sends the data over to an API service, for instance, fetching the data then from the database. Now, let's take a look what happens in this setup. There's a lot of potential failure in this setup because um, a lot of things can go wrong when you switch from the state full to the stateless. And keep in mind, our broken access control is number one always bliss, and that's there for a reason. So let me just point out some inner patterns here in this setup now. We'll start with the cookie again, the stateful setup here. And this is get, get sent over to the server. We have the session, assuming we have a session on the server in memory. At some point, well, the user goes and, and makes this request with the cookie. There's this go no go check the classical sense on the web application now. Then what next happens next is something that I call the switch. So there's a piece of code running there that, that transfers over the stateless API key to the REST client to use for the subsequent calls. In our example here, we have an API key, simple, simple key that needs to be known on both sides that is used on for the REST client. The REST client then would go and send it back over to the gateway. And the gateway says, well, there's another go no go check. Do I know this key? And since it's stateless, um, it could check the storage and says, yep, I know this key. Now, after this, the gateway wants to go and um, send the request over to the next service. Now, at this point, we're running into an issue. What is missing here? And what is missing here is the question to the answer to the question is, should all users be able to access all API services? The, the answer is certainly not, because what's missing here is that information in that we had in before in the memory space, the, the authorization information. So our enter pattern, the first one I want to point out, the technical one, is using an a, all or none API token. And by doing this, we would strip out the user authorization information. We should not just give them an all or one none token and then assume all the services are created equal later on, even though it might work in the initial phase of the application when the application is um, young. So we should plan for that and, and do it slightly better. For instance, like using a JSON web token or something that has more information in it in terms of authentication and authorization. All right, we're growing. We're growing big times. And I promise you this is going to be the, the biggest example here in my slide today. So we're adding a power user to the mix that can do refunds. Then instead of the service, we're adding a service mesh in the middle here. 
And then um, instead of the simple database, we're having this, this data, um, we're having the data lake on the right-hand side. Now, <clears throat> the human user um, uses services on the top here that are, that are aimed at the interactions from the user, uh, human user, like account, certain things with accounts or um, the personal data of the user. And it deals with tables that have personal, personable, identifiable information, PII in it. And the power user then would use the second set of tables as services and also the corresponding tables with it. Now, let's see how this works in our setup here. We upgraded the, uh, the, the um, token. So we're using a JSON web token now that has an ID in it and name, and that works with a signature. And that can be verified in a stateless fashion too by verifying the signature of the token. I left out the, the, the upper part, but we'll, um, we'll focus on the bottom part now, the REST API. So that token gets sent over to the gateway and the gateway does the signature validation. Now, when it does, when, when it finds the signature is valid, it wants to send out that token over to the, or the, the request over to the next service services, the service mesh. And we are running into an issue here. How do we actually separate in between the services and the table sets, the difference one between the roles? We are missing something here. What we're missing is a typical inter pattern that is the failure to include the role value in the token because the, the gateway does not know what role that user is in. What we need to do is we need to encode a role value here, in our case, the power user, into that token in order for in order to make that switch. We can, so we can dispatch between the services here. Well, it's a typical inner pattern um, that is often overlooked because only the authentication is put in that token, and then um, it's not it's not um, it's not implemented from the get go. Um, some workarounds would be you have to go then based on the ID of the user, fetch the authorization information from the back end and reload it. That would be the, um, the painful security that, that you have to do. There's another enter pattern related to this. And that's something that um, has to do with our latest paradigm here. The, we have a new paradigm in town. It's called zero trust architecture. Now, on the security, that means the pattern means don't trust anybody and always validate. The, on the security side, of course, we don't trust anybody anyway, but the always validate part is something that creates issues here. Currently in our setup, the, the, the gateway here does our check, the, the go no go check. Now, what happens if we actually need to make the check in the future later on the service lane in order to dispatch it or, in, or later on even in, in our data lake in the gateway in front of the data, uh, data lake? Um, you won't be able to, um, to check that because most oftentimes there's a failure to forward all the authorization token into the back end. That's something that um, needs to be considered because if you don't do this, even though you check up front, it's not just checking it and forgetting about it. If you don't do this, you, you're going to incur a lot of security debt. If you think about it, what, what do you have to do in order to fix this? You would have to go and touch every little service here and say, and every service then needs to go and, and, and send the appropriate header to the back end. Of course, you can't just do it um, brute force where you have to do it the always conform way and not just dump all the headers in there. What you want to do is snip the appropriate header out, sanitize it, and then send it over to the next layer. So don't forget to include the authorization information, even though you checked it already, just to make it future proof. All right, switching gears here slightly, still authorization, and we'll talk about a different a requirement that came in from when we oh, application grows. I'm skipping the right hand side now, and we're just focusing on the on the left hand side, starting from the API gateway. I'm also introducing here a new user or system admin on the left hand side. We have a new process here, the cron batch, that developer came up with a solution. Our requirement was marketing came and said, we need to go and send gift cards to our fav most favorable clients. Because we want to encourage them with gift cards to um, to purchase more. Now, developers said, well, we can do that in form of a cron batch job that then fires off a request to the API gateway and uses, reuses the services that would do a refund. Um, the gift cards are a highly valuable item on the black market, so we need to protect them. Now, the question is though, which role do we actually wanna use for this batch job? 
Do you want to use a system admin rule? That's too high. That's just, we don't want to use a system admin rule. That um, would be too much privilege at this point. Now, do you want to use a power user rule for this? Potentially, that, that's a valid option if you don't have hundreds of power users and if you don't have um, potentially hundreds of system admins that you don't cannot vet anymore. What we really want to do, though, is in the ideal setup, we would want to pretend it was a human user that requested a refund and then use that somehow to do this batch transaction and fire that off against the gateway. Um, oftentimes, though, we, we don't do that because it's forgotten. We just use a payload in the batch process. So our pattern here is the batch processing without user authorization. So we stripped. We don't have any user authorization in the batch. We just drop the data in there. That's an inner pattern we can see quite frequently. There's something else we can do about it, and that is we can fix that. We can actually put the token, create a token per user, and put that in the batch job. This will also um, solve our, some a repudiation issue. That means if the user would have to do something before and like filling out a survey or something, then with that pay, a token in there, we can go and and pretend the user actually ran that or another, like the sales role ran it on behalf of the user, for instance, and fire those um, batch jobs off against the gateway that then does then the, the refund at the back end. All right, our last authorization pattern for today is performance integration testing related. Now, we have a performance tester role and, and, a, and a client, an SSH client that tests our system. The performance tester is usually used um, even in production, not only in low environments, to see if, if some critical systems are still up and running. And most likely they have also, ex that, that role has access to production data. This leads to the question, which role would be appropriate for performance integration tester? The power user role in this case is slightly too high and it's think about refunds or emailing campaigns, maybe you don't wanna to touch all parts of the system. You wanna to touch some elevated parts and find out if they are live, but not maybe do certain transactions. So it's slightly too high. And that human user is slightly too low because you wanna to touch those elevated um, roles like HR systems. So in order to fix this, you actually have to plan ahead and create a performance tester role with a dedicated role. So performance testing without dedicated user role, that's an inter pattern. You, that's something you need to put in and plan ahead so you can do those tests and then scope it accordingly to the performance tester. As a bonus tip, when you do this, make sure you don't store your credentials in the code repo together with the script, of course. It has to be properly mounted and properly um, um, assembled there and not just checked into the code repo. <clears throat> All right, shifting gears here a little bit. The next um, set will talk about timing enter patterns and time related enter patterns. Okay, so a couple slides ago, I talked about the batch job. So the batch job is a typical example. Let's say we can do this um, in, a, in a fashion where we only have a few system admins and only a few power users. So we can do that actually in that maybe case. Now, this setup is something what I call a behavioral pivot from one element to the next. The power user would go and delegate certain things out of system admin and, and, and tell the system admin, here's my batch file and, and go run this for me. On, a, on an abstract sense here, what we're dealing with is we have an instruction set in terms of a batch file. Then we have a time process that's the cron job that executes something. The file write is, is one, um, one behavior. And then the execution is a second behavior that runs in a second role. The, the refund is a higher role than the system admin role. Keep that in mind. Now, this is a legit example. And um, it can run like this. But um, when we look at those behavioral pivots, that's very interesting to see when we don't have a legit example. That would be something that we need to look out for in a malicious case. And I'm going to show you some examples of that, how this works out. All right. Very similar setup, same idea. We have a power user that refunds money and using queue at this point, and that queue has a queue file associated with it um, for storing the, the, the instructions overnight because the payment refund process runs overnight. Then again, our instruction set is in the queue file and the time process is the process here in the queue. So that's worthwhile noting. The system admin could do a file drop in the queue file. Now at this point, we have to ask ourselves, 
what happens if that role flips over to malicious? This is a touchy feely question because um, we don't want to assume we have bad employees here. If you ask HR, they say we love our employees. We trust them with everything minus the salary information, of course. And if you ask the security people like me, they would say, well, I don't trust anybody anyway, so don't worry about that. No, the reality is there's a middle ground there, right? If the system grows, you're running, there's a threshold where you have a lot of, um, where you have to assume when you get more and more internal admins that the probability of one of those roles flipping is getting higher and higher, or somebody uses social engineering to flip one of those roles, or a system gets into that role that runs on that as that. So the, you, this enter pattern here that we see quite often is the failure to protect instructions out of a time process. That's the pattern that's that's um, relevant for internal in, um, attack scenarios or internal um, malicious in actors. So keep that in mind, and I'll show you some more examples of that flavor of the variation, how this would pan out. Next one here, very similar setup. We have a script engine that the power would, user would use to make some calculations, and it's also tied to payment process. Now, system admin could also have access to this code that this engine uses. So we, again, we have instruction set, time process. The system admin could go modify the code, potentially unchecked, and then go and pivot through and then use that script engine to call the critical payment process. Um, another internal admin, not, this time not a system admin, it's a DevOps user. So let's assume in our example here, we have a CICD runner that, that creates something for us like this batch file, for instance, the payload would be something like this that would be run and created in that, in that payload here. Um, for that matter, we check in code into our Git repo, and we have a DevOps user that, is, that they can touch that code repo. The Devo, if that DevOps user turns malicious or somebody gets in the role, we would be able, he would be able to, and Tekka would be able to change the instruction set and then um, kick off a time process or change a time process then that, that uh, was hooked to a critical process. Same idea. The last example in this series here is this um, the cloud event trigger. <clears throat> so this is our cloud setup. We have a DevOps user that it has some kind of cloud storage access where we have instruction set in the cloud storage. And it uses an event trigger based on um, changes to that storage, for instance. And that, that event trigger in the regular case would call a callback function like a Lambda functions or a uh, cloud function. Now again, instruction set, time process, somebody gets in the role, they could um, fire this off and call this critical process. All right, so what can we do about it? What are the mitigations for this? Here we see different variations of the whole thing, same thing, different um, systems and setups though. Of course, we can write protect the instruction in the code file, and we can do that. Now, in some cases, like the queue, if it actually needs the persistent file, it would not be possible to do that. The next more expensive option would be to, to sign the payload or the content of the instruction file. Um, so we have um, payload encryption in that case to sign that. Um, there's a case where we have to that we have, have to also consider, and that is the case that an attacker would go, for instance, the queue file with that with the payment process would go and request a refund, and then go and fish off his own transaction out of the queue, and then just goes in and duplicates that file. Now in that case, we have to do one more thing: we have to actually introduce a unique ID as part of the payload that we then sign and, and protect it against duplication. So that would be something even more complex that we can do. All right, let's shift some gears here again. Another set that I wanna talk about is systems that don't mix well. This is something that we see that certain systems, they just don't play well together with each other. All right, the first thing I want to note is something that came up today in one of some other talks too, the search engine versus encryption. Now on the right hand side here, we have our data lake that can, contains encrypted data. On the left hand side, we have our search engine and that search in the, uh, engine uses indexing, indexes the encrypted data in our data lake. Now, of course, search engine searching on encrypted data does not mix well for multiple different reasons. The one reason is we need to have access to the key. Now there are some options that are not optimal, but they are feasible um, that you can do 
to use a search engine for that. There's some non-optimal options here. So for instance, we can run the search engine with elevated access to key or multiple keys. If you do like um, multiple like envelope encryption or row level encryption, you would have access to multiple keys across all records. That potentially creates issues if there are a lot of records in there because you're only one hop away from like a catastrophe. For instance, if a developer goes and wants to drop in an API in front of this, like a slightly outdated API like GraphQL that has a serialization flaw um, like then in front of that engine, then somebody could tunnel in. And then of course that, that, that attacker could go and, and get have access to all the data and siphon all the data out one by one. So the access to the key here is relatively questionable. So you have to be careful with that. Then what you can also do is, of course, you can index the non-PII fields in plain text. That's all. You can always do that. Then there's something like you can build yourself a custom index ba based out of hashed value or like do some kind of a um, search encryption schemes. That's a custom um, custom code and that's, that's feasible, um, relatively new and relatively risky in terms of um, using libraries that might not, not be working the same way in the future. Excuse me. All right, so something we have to think about. Another system that doesn't mix well, that has to also do with the searching, is something that actually not only um, that not only outdoes, um, that not only doesn't play well together, they, there is a potential there that systems um, reverse each other's con security controls. Now, in our case here, we have a data lake that has um, de-identified data in it. So that's that's used for low environments to to train artificial intelligence systems or using data uh, for for testing. And what you do is you remove the key identifiers and chunk up the data in smaller pieces, and then you can go and and work with the data without with the real data, real formats, without um, and knowing actually where the data belongs to. Now, unfortunately, this, what you have to know is a search engine reverses de-identification efforts. And it does it in certain ways. The first way of does it is um, it can programmatically run, uh, run rounds of elimination to re-identify data. So if you have kids and ever played this game, guess who? That's very similar to how this would work. Um, you basically go and, and 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 eliminate records that have a certain criteria, like all users here on the right, all all people that that have um, blonde hair get all eliminated. And then you only set left with a certain subset of records that are very small and you can re-correlate them. There's another issue related with the search engine and that, that de-identified data. And that is, there's a potential there that the search engine has direct access to our, uh, to, to the metadata and is able to reverse index that metadata. For instance, if somebody can write a query that, that says, give me all records that um, with an index value of one, two, three to one, two, seven, then they would be able to re-identify the records in that range and especially if that data is sorted still in the, in the backend, um, they would be able to, to re-identify that. So that's something you have to know and keep in mind when you design those systems that involve a search engine and de-identified data. <clears throat> this, this third example that I want to point out here, that systems that don't match, it's actually not a system that doesn't match with something else. It's a, it's a zone that doesn't match with something else. On the right-hand side here, we have an or onshore um, data lake. Now we have a hard requirement from compliance here that says we are not the, our data is not allowed to leave our premises. On the left hand side, though, we have our on, offshore application that reads and and reads data from our onshore application. On the offshore zone, no persistence data there. Now, of course, what we see quite often is we have systems that indirectly store persistence data in in the restricted zone, and so they. They're storing it in there and then and then that creates compliance issue. So you can only use the data in transit, but not store it there. Some systems that indirectly process data, for instance, are our search index, for instance, right? So we have a search system index that writes data in the wrong spot, in the wrong zone. Then a cache, since transfer takes a long time, it's very tempting to just put a cache on the other side and fix that transport time by just looking it up locally. Now that of course, of course creates caching issue. Uh, that creates an issue with the cache then being written out. Then the queue, um, we have a queue file here that is attached to a queue um, that could land in the wrong zone. 
Another, another example that I didn't put there, that's like a stream source like Kafka, frequently has um, has uh, file storage associated with it. And logging agents are one of those um, systems that also frequently write into that into an area like this. All right. Um, we talked about systems that don't match. Now, there's another set that I want to point out. And those are systems that create issues once you scale up and create more of those systems. The first system here has to do with our service mesh. Very, um, if you zoom in on one of those, very similar setup here. Usually we have a service node here that talks to another service load, node. And we're using a public key infrastructure with certificate then in order to make, make them communicate with each other and using HTTPS, for instance, for that protocol in between. Now each service node has a key vault associated with it and a certificate storage um, associated with it. The key vault contains a unique private key that needs to be reprotected and the certificate storage uh, contains a public key and then root certificate and then potentially some intermediate certificates. That holds true for all other nodes in that setup. Now, public key infrastructure, key have an issue with it, right? That most people know and that is they expire. So the question is, can we manually provision this time times 100 or 1,000 per year? Well, of course we cannot do this, right? So using a PKI without even planning for automation or key and certificate management is a big no-no. That's a big anti pattern. We need to do this and address this. Of course, if you're using like a service mesh, they have that feature in it, but don't forget to plan for automation for your entry and exit nodes together with that. That's that needs to be automated. And then, of course, A-B testing, rollover, all those kind of things are very important things that need to be automated and be able to replicate that in a certain, uh, in, in a very um, robust fashion. Key rotation brings down big companies. That's what we saw in the past. The big companies had outings because of key and certificates expirations. So keep that in mind. That's an Achilles heel of, of a whole cloud setup. All right, last inner pattern here that I want to discuss is scalability versus scaling, rate limiting versus scaling. Scaling, when you have services that need to be um, ramped up according to a certain load, that's something that an orchestrator would do in a in a cloud setup. Um, on the security side, though, we might have a requirement that, that means slow requests down and, and limit that so people cannot abuse our API or they cannot, um, they have, there's a licensing restriction tied to that. Now, the precursor to any rate limiting, though, is you have to be able to uniquely identify a caller. That means you have to know who the caller is all the way back to um, that device. Generally speaking, though, we have two opposing requirements. The responses are supposed to be slowed down or blocked if the requests come in too fast. And then on the other side, on the, on the scaling fashion, we have a service orchestrator that would instantiate new nodes if the services are, come, um, are too slow. So this is a anti pattern that you have to think about that rate limiting throttling does not scale up by design now that's an absolute statement here in reality it's not as absolute though but it becomes more and more absolute the more you breach your precursor here the uniquely uniquely identifying your caller so think about this way let's say you have a train network where people commuting in, and then people commuting to work and they are all using the same exit IP address and you think you have your caller uniquely identified but you don't um, in that case you would punish everybody else that comes from the same network that checks for instance their stock quotes or whatever in the morning while going to work and using the public wi-fi of your train operator so if you if you cannot uniquely identify your caller then this will apply now there's a slightly better way of doing this a better somewhat mitigation you can use a quantifier in your token to deal with this so instead of throttling you can actually give them a token that has an has an amount encoded in it like 100 queries for instance or they can query 100, 500 records here in my example and that expires very fast now that with that token of course they can go and further off across all servers at once but it's a somewhat mitigation for this setup all right so we're done with our enter patterns and let's discuss what we can actually do about it here. What, what's the plan here? This 
those these inner patterns fall into the awareness section. So awareness is key here. What we need to do is start documenting this and create a library of inner patterns. Now, the lower complexity, I call it the single hop patterns, we would put, uh, we could put into our thread library. That would be an easy thing to do. When you, if you have a thread modeling tool in library, we can put that in. Um, everything dealing with one, one element, you can document it there and say, yeah, check that out. Now, the more complex patterns that are dealing with behavioral changes and the require more documentation, we need to put into a wiki or confluence and classify them like I just started doing and, and put them in there. Now, unfortunately, when you have new practitioners doing doing the threat modeling and, and the design, then they it takes time for the secure person or developers to recognize those patterns. They are quite abstract. So with that, we have to be able, we have to go and create a list of red flag terms, for instance, that points them to the parents so they can recognize it. Because um, newer people that don't have the experience, they tend to think very specific. So we would give them a list like time, Q, um, time, Q, or um, a batch file, for instance. And then it's like, yep, yeah, go and check out um, that pattern and see if it applies to you. Of course, we can also go and create a starter template for them, one starter template threat models where they can address some of these issues and look that up. So here's another, uh, I just put the summary out here for that list um, of the patterns. And there are some more though, too, that we can add to it. And that needs to go somewhere, you know, typically in our library. So we need to start thinking about where to put this and how to communicate this. There's another awareness action item that I want to point out, and that is, <clears throat> that's on us, the secure people. We need to learn from the developers what is easy to do and what is not so easy to do. Of course, when we tell them certain things that need to do, they start moaning and tell us, you know, that's that's something that's easy or not, right? But we need to actually document that and write that down. So there's a there's a scale here, for instance. Basic authentication might be totally easy to do, volume encryption slightly more. If you want to do encrypt flow data and transit, that's more involved because you have to put a key somewhere or change more things at once. Implementing custom authorization, that's more complex, touches code, uh, all potentially all over the place if you have to put a custom library in somewhere. Then individual record or payload encryption, that's on potentially even more involved because you need to deal with the keys, you need to have a receiver, sender, decryptor, signer, whatever. Um, test this out, don't break anything and change everything out at once. Right? So there's a complexity here, and, and that's something that we need to put in a ranking system. And and then when, once we're going through those sessions, we can check up front and tell them, give them a heads up and say, hey, by the way, if you plan on using this in this setup, you might want to put that in right away, there's certain things. Apart from this awareness, there's something more we can do. And that is, we can do a little bit more proactive things. Like we can create platform services that implement fully configured security features. If you ever downloaded like a database appliance, um, then you'll know that the database appliance these days comes with a script that creates a system user and it creates a regular user as part of the setup. That's what something that I would consider fully configured platform. And of course, um, open ports and stuff, leave that out for now, but that that's from the authentication perspective, that's a pretty good configured platform. So we want to try to create something like this for our design setups. Like for instance, we could enforce the role that they just talked about the placeholder in the token and say, well, something needs to be there. And I don't care in the beginning if it's a dummy place, but it needs to be in there so we can actually deal with it in the future. Because we don't want to have an empty token in the future be being presented because that creates a dilemma for us. Then what we can also do is <clears throat> we could create multiple business rules as a part of an infrastructure as a service setup up front that we have a regular user and then we have a power user, for instance. Then, then something like the data lake example, for instance, where we could require the developer that starts using that, even in development, to present a token that's fully configured, even in the development phase. That'll create a bunch of moaning up front, but on the other hand, it's there and they need to use it right away. And then they don't really bypass that from the get-go. They need to work with it as is right away. We can do a little bit more with pre-configured templates like infrastructure as service modules, for instance, Terraform or AWS Config. 
we can provide those um, templates that work together and have pre-configured setups that work well together. So for instance, the queue could have a write protected storage file associated with it. And, it, and then um, for instance, if you create a stream source that has appropriate buckets or um, and roles that would deal with um, certain execution roles um, that are higher level. So we can set that up at the same time. So those, those, um, those, those modules, something that we can, um, that, that we can provide and build out over time once we see those patterns. Now this concludes my speech for today. Um, I'm curious to see what you guys are thinking about this. Um, for questions, if you don't want to ask this in Wover, you can certainly send it over to Wover or hit me up here on LinkedIn. Um, and see, curious to see and find out what we should could do with those. Um, should we categorize them in a different way? Any ideas for that? I certainly have more ideas for more patterns, certain things I did not talk about, like our example in the beginning, the title slide was simultaneous access, for instance, something that, that I didn't talk about in the, in the application. I come across more and more patterns um, as we speak. So let me hand it over back to um, Jackie, our moderator. And then